right. you're somebody who waffles, go hire somebody who puts you in a kind of crappy product and you at least do it. Because I've seen a ton of people reach their goals using crappy stuff. Yeah. But I've never seen anybody reach a goal with perfect stuff that doesn't save. Yeah. Never, ever have they reached their goals. Hi, and welcome to the Micro Empires Podcast, where we learn how to build small empires for wealth and security, because you don't have to be wealthy to build wealth. I'm Jennifer Grimson. I'm your host. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. Today's episode is with Joe Saul Sihai. He is the host of Stacking Benjamins and a bunch of other shows that I'm sure you've heard about in the financial world. It's a great show. He's a hilarious guy. We talk about money, money and shame. We talk about why hiring a coach makes sense if you want to learn something really quickly. We talk about how you should go about selecting a financial advisor. So some great tips, and I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think. Joe Saul Sihai, thank you so much for being here. The host of Stacking Benjamins and a whole bunch of other shows. And I really appreciate you being here. I'm super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we kind of had a, a fit and a start before where we started an interview and we got interrupted. So we're, so we're doing it again. But the benefit of that for me that I wanted to touch base with was how you and I came to find each other. I mean, I've, I've been following Stacking Benjamins and I follow you on Twitter by the way, your dad joke game is on fire. Um, I have one, I have one for you for the for the books anyway. I'll tell you later. But maybe you could say like how we came. Like I got to meet you, and you're here now on my show. You, you know, there's there's often people that join the financial community, join the discussion, and sometimes people join it in a way that I think is the right way. And other people, and this is going to sound so judgy, <laughs> there's other times people join it the wrong way. Like as an example, you know, we have three shows a week and we maybe get 27 pitches a week for people that want to be on the show or want to be a part of the show. Wow. I don't know if you ever wanted anything more than to be a part of our community. So you just yeah. started tweeting stuff back, engaging in the conversation with the other stackers in our family yeah. and really became a part of the family to the point that you wrote something that made me laugh. <laughs> and then I saw Micro Empires and I clicked on it. And then I listened to the podcast. Thank you. And I heard you having a phenomenal discussion that actually, and I told you this before we started recording, that even influenced our show. Like we had a team meeting talking about, hey, we need to do some of this stuff that this woman that Jennifer is interviewing was talking about. And just as I learned more, I thought, you know what? We need to see if she'll come and be more of a part of our community. So you're coming on the Stacking Benjamin show. And I'm so excited. And that was all funny. And then, like then way after that, I we'd laugh some on Twitter. We'd exchange some stuff back and forth. And then I hear an interview that you're doing with your husband. And generally, <laughs> when I hear podcasters have have a spouse on the show. I'm like, oh, she's out of material already. Right, right. <laughs> like she's, uh, it's COVID. She's interviewing her, him and the dog, you know. Yeah, that's she's right. Got nothing left. Time to bring on the family members because <laughs> I'm out of stuff. Right. And I'm like, oh, I hope I, I hope this isn't the end. And then I found out that, that I've been watching your husband play hockey yeah. for a good part of his career. And he and is a good guy for, with Detroit. But as I told him, I still think of him kind of as the enemy. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. A lot of people see him that way. A lot of people and he, still see him that and he, way. He was way nicer in person. He didn't try to check me into the boards or, this is true. you know, none of that. This yeah. is true. You haven't met him in person. He tells, he tells people all the time. He's like, I'm not the one you need to be afraid of. It's her. Every single time he's like, <laughs> she's, you know, it's so funny. He does when I, when I first met him and I kind of knew a little bit about his background, I was you know, I prejudged and thought, well, this guy is going to have a big ego and an anger, you know, anger issues and whatever. He doesn't have an angry streak. He doesn't. He's like, the, I mean, but I do. So I, I take it up for the family. Which is not at all his on ice persona was, no. was, 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 was not that at all. So your on ice persona yes. is maybe a little, little different than that. Yeah. yeah. But I think, but, but, but I think getting back, you know, getting away from, from Stu and back to you, I think the lesson for anybody building 
a brand is, is to just, just be a part of the community, be a part of the discussion. And I know as a guy who gets afraid of everything, I'm always afraid to speak out, to talk yeah. about stuff. People, people like you being a part of the discussion, you know, yeah. and don't be afraid that your take is bad or that it's wrong or that it's whatever. Just, just be a part of it. And right. I don't know, that, that's become really fun. I feel like I have friends all over the world now because of Stacking Benjamins. And it's really, really cool. Uh, there's this guy, Niran John, who we write back and forth maybe once a month. He's in Mumbai, India, and listens wow. to our show. And I know if I ever go to Mumbai, I've got Niran John as, as a buddy. Yeah. What's weird, by the way, the first time that we had a meetup was in Denali. I had wow. two friends that work in a, we were headed to, to the national park and I had two friends who were miners right outside of Denali and they wrote to me and said, hey, we work the night shift and we listen to you while we're, while we're mining and can we maybe meet up for breakfast at the end of our shift? And I said, sure. And it was the first time I'd ever met anybody who listened to our show. And I told Cheryl, I'm like, okay, if I'm not back in like an hour, like, <laughs> like, like who the hell, who the hell wants who to be Who is our me? audience? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yes. I, I am probably going to be cut up into little pieces because I don't know what freak would ever want to, <laughs> whatever want to know me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. And now I've met people almost, you know, before COVID, wherever we met now, wherever we go, I try to meet people. And you attract people who are like you yeah. and, and you repel people who aren't. You know? right. So right. These, these guys were just, just like me. We had so much fun and yeah, yeah. Just be a part of the discussion. It's interesting. I had someone say to me in my family, which is family dynamics are always so much fun. You know, somebody who's been in my family for like 33 years and probably doesn't listen to the podcast or anything. And she said, so is that your plan now? You, you want to be a celebrity? <laughs> And I was like, well, if that's my plan, I am failing miserably. <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, my, the purpose of this podcast is to give people opportunities and access to tools. And again, it, the reason it fueled my fire to do this was because as I was going through the rebuilding, I kept finding all of these tools that I never knew existed. And I felt like they had been kept a secret. And I knew I was going to keep going. And people kept asking me, how did you do this? How did you do this? And I thought, well, if I record it all, then we can know it, it serves so many, so many avenues and I have access to everything. Like right now we're actually looking at investments in self-storage and I can reach out in the community and get really great advice kind of across the board. I, two, ten, three years ago, I never would have thought of something like that happening. So it's been great. Yeah. It's been really nice. Yeah, it is nice. And I've, I met somebody who said the same thing. He said he was listening to, he listens to the podcast and he's a police officer. He says, I listen, I work the night shift. So it's two in the morning and I'm listening to you in like out in DC. And I think, wow, I mean, just so cool. It's so amazing. And, you know, just really encouraging. And I'm encouraged. I, I think a lot of my message goes to women, but I, like nearly 40% of my audience is men. So that is exciting to me because it, it goes across all the boards. But I also think, and we were just having this conversation, that because this financial community or any community can be often intimidating for women. So it's great when men are standing beside us and just being like, you know, yes, I'm listening. Yes, I get it. Yes, this brings me value as well. But there's also something to be said for, you know, having a safe haven to ask questions and to you know, really gain some knowledge. Yeah, this is a community that very much is much more than a lot, seems to me to be equal opportunity. I mean, you know, we're a podcast that features a couple middle-aged white guys, <laughs> but we really think a ton about diversity and not as a some baloney checkbox corporate program, but because if I'm a show that's trying to attract a wide audience, it's so much easier to bring somebody to the table if there's somebody on the show who has a similar background as my listener has. And because my, my partner OG and I have really one very closely related point of view from our backgrounds, we have to have lots of people on from lots of different backgrounds. So if people are going to get a story that brings them into the discussion, because then I think you find out later on that even though somebody who looks like you and maybe has a background like you 
is a great entry in there. Later on, the fun of it is finding people who aren't like you right. and how much fun it is to, to learn from somebody that has a completely different point of view yeah. than you. Like the, you know, the first time that I learned that, that black men in America are really screwed at the time they're born was at this meeting I went to for a nonprofit I was on. It was something that until I was maybe 44 years old, I had no idea the statistics and just how absolutely, absolutely horrible they were. Right. You know, that, that just, if you're born a man of color in America, mm-hmm. your chances of success, not that high, mm-hmm. not that high. Mm-hmm. So, and it's, you know, it's interesting because I, one of the episodes I do, it talks about inclusion and diversity. And, but really, it was shortly after George Floyd's murder. And it was, my message was, I don't really know what I can add you know, to this conversation being, you know, one of the whitest women you'll all ever meet in your life. However, I can tell you that in my life, I've had always had a diverse group of friends and influencers in my life, many from the African-American community. And my life has been so enhanced because of that. And that's all I can tell you is that like, I have benefited greatly. It's not fair. It's not even fair. And there's been so much that I've learned here. I am thinking, you know, well, I'm pretty open-minded. I, that's what anybody who thinks, oh, I'm not a racist because I have, you know, friends or whatever, but I've learned so much. One of the big things that I've learned is about this stereotype about the angry black woman, which I didn't really understand. And it's this, it's literally a label that many uh, black women are fearful of. And I would be too, where if you come on too strong, if you do too much, then you're the angry black woman. And then you're just dismissed. You know, it's kind of like being the, it happens to women. I'm sure it happens to men, but I don't know how it happens to them, but definitely. And certainly in my life, yes, I I can be described as aggressive and a lot of other things, but my give a shit button got broke years ago. So I guess I don't care very much, but you do get labeled. I have definitely been labeled and you do, do invoke fear. I definitely invoked that in, in some of my places, but it was by design, but it's, you know, so much has been uncovered to me. And my primary realization is that I need to do more. And that's why anything I can do to lift other people, no matter their color, you know, men, women, whatever, in any way is what I want to do. But especially to people of color and women, I want to help them because we are, you know, underrepresented and underpaid, et cetera. And those are all statistics. You know, I'm not just making yeah. it up. Bobby, my co-host on our Money with Friends podcast, where we go over headlines. I was very surprised when she and I started working together almost two years ago now. The criticisms that she gets, this is as a white woman, just the, the criticism she gets that people would never give me in a million years. Like it's always been, you know, OG and I as as host and man, when I partnered with a woman as my co-host, just if you go look at some of our iTunes re- reviews, her voice is shrill. Like you get that review, yeah. you know, I'm like, like, come on, come on, give me a break. Y- yeah. I-, I mean, some of the, some of the, the stuff that she gets that people in a million years would never give me is just, un- I don't know. Yep. It's unbelievable. I see that. I heard that in an interview the other day with frugal friends and they were the two women on frugal friends. And they were yeah. saying that that's half of it. Half of it is it, you know, your appearance, your voice, your opinion, things that, that men never get picked apart at and you will. So you have to have a really, you have to have a really tough skin. It's not really fair, but there is a, we were talking about this before. There's some beauty in, in getting older, like, uh, like, you know, the good news is I'm not running for prom queen. So <laughs> it doesn't matter if you think I'm good looking or popular or anything, none of that crap matters. So, but that takes a long time. And this is such a weird I mean, think about when we were in high school, like we had no way to do any of this stuff. And we have, you know, you see yourself on camera every single day and social media, all of this stuff, it just didn't even exist. I don't even know if it's good. It just is what it is, right? In fact, I don't really think it's good. We were out hiking this weekend, Cheryl, my spouse and I, and we were talking about that, about social media is what it is, but I don't really think it's great. Mm-hmm. I actually kind of think I'd, you know, maybe this is old guy talk, but I kind of like it the way it was before social yeah. media. Yeah. It's very different. It's so funny. Remember you used to, I mean, I lived in Russia back when it was communist. I was studying there for a while. And I just remember I had a friend of mine who was American and we had 
somehow been connected to a woman who was Russian that we were going to go meet. And there had been letters written, but she didn't have a telephone. We didn't have a telephone. So we went to this train station, didn't know what she looked like, you know, and just waited, you know, for like an hour because you got to give somebody a long period of time to find you. And they, you know, we just find it just like show up at this train station at this time and hopefully I'll be there or not. We don't know. But those were some of the, the greatest times. And there's some some great things about it, definitely. The reach is amazing. I mean, the fact that like 15 countries are listening to my show is just blows my mind that there's people all over the world listening to it. So I'm grateful for that, definitely. Hey, everyone. I just wanted to take a moment and tell you about Streamline Podcasts. If it weren't for Streamline Podcasts, I wouldn't have this show. They literally take the audio, they edit it, they do all of the notes, they create the social collateral, they provide all of the resources. They're the reasons the recording sounds so crisp and clear. And here's the crazy thing. They do it at a really affordable rate. Like I've never seen anything like it. So if you're interested in podcasting and you don't want to do any of the editing yourself or go out there and try to find an audio editor and then someone to transcribe your notes and then someone else to create socials for you, I'm telling you Streamline Podcasts is the way to go. You can find them at streamlinepodcasts.com. And if you are my listener and you want to fill out a little form and they will meet with you for free, but use the promo code JIVES, J-I-V-E-S, and you will get a discount for being my listener. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. So one of the things I like to ask people who come on the show is I love to know what your money culture was growing up and how that affected you. You talked a little bit about your parents to me before, but growing up, the culture of money in your home and what that had as an effect on you, work ethic and your relationship with money before you headed out to the world all on your own. We had two things. The first one was talking about money was forbidden. We did not talk about family money at all, like a lot of families. In fact, I remember, so I'm the oldest of three and I remember my sister's much younger, but my brother and I remember us coming into the room a few times. My parents are having either a money discussion or a heated fight about money and we immediately were told to leave the room. Mm-hmm. Like we, we did not participate at all in what was going on with, with, with family's money, which led to when I got to college, one of my, first, so I went to the Citadel, the military college of South Carolina. Oh. And when I was, when I, when I, I was maybe a weekend, so I'd had my head shaved and, you know, was learning how to march and all this stuff. But I go into Mark Clark Hall and there's a line at this table. And I don't remember if it was, if we got, if we got a a stadium blanket or a shirt or something, but we could sign up for an American Express card. Ooh. Oh, and I thought that that was going to be awesome because now I can get plastic and, and everybody else seems to be getting one. So I get in line and of course, I fill out the application and a week and a half later, maybe two weeks later, I have this shiny new American Express card. Boom. And the first time we got leave, which it's funny, college had leave because it's a military school. We go out to this mall in North Charleston, probably, I think it was five of my friends. And and anyway, we went to this high-end restaurant called Ruby Tuesdays. Not sure if you're familiar (laughs) with it. Oh, that's so swanky. I don't know. (laughs) I've never been. I don't know. I am place, Jennifer. It's, I know. it's amazing. They had a tablecloth. Yeah. Ooh. And then so you, yeah, salad bar, salad okay. bar, not love, just salad, salad bar. I, yes. love an all, I love a buffet. Right. And when they, and, 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 and soft drinks, all you can drink. Oh gosh. All you can, yes. I know. Deal. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Huge. So we, the bill comes and I take out that card and I said, I got it. Oh, boy. cause I'm going to be really cool. So oh, I pay for all six of us. Then I walked down the mall and Nordstrom is on the other end of the mall. And there was this badass, by the way, the year is 1986. Yep. <laughs> so I am, there's this badass, looks like something Duran Duran would have wore this, this purple sweater with this oh like funky neck, V neck. Oh, killing me. <laughs> around it. Oh, oh, oh it was just, God. it was awesome. And of course, it's at Nordstrom, so it's not cheap. And I went and bought this sweater. Now, I'm, I'm in a military college. Right. I can't wear a damn wear sweater. Mm-hmm. And I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. What the hell do I want a sweater for in Charleston, South Carolina? So, But I buy it because that's not stopping me. And anyway, so about 
you know, 30 days later, my first bill shows up. And here's the, and once again, we'd never talked about money. So I'm right. like, what the hell is this? Like, I got to pay for this stuff? And it's American Express, yeah. which at that time had no option except pay it all in full, right? Right. So I did what any smart person would do. I called my mom yeah. and I said, mom, we have a problem. And mom said, no, we don't have a problem. You have a problem. And she said, figure it out. And of course, once again, I'm at a military college. No way for me to figure it out. I can't get a job. So 60 days later-ish, my card was taken away and my credit was wrecked. I spent a good part of the next summer paying a collection agency off all the money that I had. Now, what, what's funny as an end point to that story is later on, I became a spokesperson for American Express. And I'm like, you guys didn't do any due diligence. <laughs> you're you're let me speak on behalf of the company. Yeah. And yeah. I was a dude that couldn't even handle one of your credit cards. So that was, that was the beginning. The positive thing that I did get from my parents, my parents are very hard workers. Mm -hmm. And I always learned, and this is what I tried to tell my kids, is that you will sometimes have people smarter than you, but you can't be outworked. That's completely in your control. How hard you work is completely in your control. And certainly you want to work smarter right? as much as work harder. But if I don't know the smart thing to do, I will still just keep working. I, right. will, I will work somebody else under the table because I can do that. It's interesting because I, I have a brother and a sister who went to West Point and I have a nephew who just graduated from West Point and my brother married a West Point grad. So very familiar with the military college and, and also very familiar that people in military colleges also have zero sense of fashion because you never <laughs> pick anything out. Like when my sister graduated from, she was like the third class of women. When she graduated from West Point, it was like, it was like helping the blind. I mean, she was just so lost at any kind of fashion. <laughs> But of course, it was the 80s, so fashion was, you know. Oh, this sweater was classy with a K. Oh my gosh, so funny. And interesting that your parents didn't talk about money. I think that's really common. And I even find it now, people find it shocking. If they want to talk to me or seek advice or whatever, the first, you know, I'm asking questions. How much do you make? What's your mortgage? What's, you know, where's your biggest monthly expense? What do you want to, what, how do you want to spend the next 10 years of your life? You know, those sorts of questions. And people... I still find that shocking. And it is a little bit like it's this thing we're not supposed to talk about, but also there's this whole push that it's this thing that we're all supposed to act like we've got it. I've got right. it handled. It's fine. When I think we know statistically like only 17% of Americans have any kind of savings for retirement. And, you know, most senior citizens will only have access to $2,000 a month when they are unable to work. So it's this crazy American thing that we're all fine. We're all good. And that's just how we have to keep it. I get it when it comes to religion and politics, right? They say religion, politics, and money don't talk about them. Religion and politics, I totally get it, right? right. But, but, but the money thing, I, I just don't understand where that came from, like what that is about. And maybe it's you don't want to brag because you, you had a lot of money, you know? Mm -hmm. I did have this neighbor when we were, when when we when we lived in Texas. She she would make it a point all the time. In fact, it was funny. Her name's Betty, and she's notorious in the town of Texarkana, Texas. Anybody listening to this in Texarkana, Texas knows exactly what I'm talking about. Who Betty is? Yeah, who Betty is? Okay. Yes. And Betty lived a couple doors down from me. But when I met Betty, she made it a point of telling me that she had two million dollars just brought it up in conversation that she had $2 million. <laughs> like you and, do. and it was funny because, because I told my friend, told my friend, Hal, who we'd have lunch together every Friday. I said, Hey, so I met Betty. And his very first question was, did she tell you that she has $2 million? Yeah. And I went, yeah. He goes, yeah, she tells everybody that. She yeah. She just, that. and don't you love the fact that she slides it into conversation? So maybe it's that, maybe it's, you don't want to brag about your money. But the sad thing is, is now we're in this culture where most everybody's in debt. Nobody's in, nobody's great with money. And now it's, we don't talk about the huge amounts of debt we have and we can't afford any of the crap that we buy. We're all living yeah. this debt cycle life, which is not that great. We should talk about it more. Yeah. It was when I started this podcast, that was, I mean, I talk about this. I kept all of the stuff that happened to me a secret 
unless you really knew me well, you wouldn't have known. And I was maintaining the facade. That's I learned that when I learned how to sail. My sailing instructor said, rule number one, maintain the facade. <laughs> just, just act like you know what the hell you're doing. So I was maintaining the facade for years and I decided with the podcast, I was just going to have to tell the truth about how bad it was and what it took to get out of that and the mind shift, complete mindset shift that had to happen. It, so then what, you become a financial advisor, correct? Financial yes. planner. And you're that, yes. you're that way for like 16 years. And then you yes. move into, I guess you call it financial media. But yeah. what was the shift? And this is what I was just starting to get to the last time we talked, but there are, you know, especially in the FinCon or the FI community, whatever, there's good and bad about financial advisors. There's a lot of like, don't trust them, don't go near them. And then there are good. So maybe you could walk us through what it was like for you and what people should look for if you're, because I think there's, I understand completely being like, all right, I want to understand all this, but I have a job and I'm working hard and I need someone to help me. And so who can I go to and how do people, you know, figure out a good financial advisor from a bad one? It always frustrates me when I hear people and people that I really like to in financial media that say don't have a financial advisor because whether it's a financial advisor or a diet coach or somebody to help me, you know, lift heavy objects, whatever, whatever part of my life it is, the smartest people that I know always surround themselves with smarter people than them. And I always think to myself, why would I not want to surround myself with people who handle money really, really well, who know, who know me, who are not emotionally invested in my goals like I am. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to get all emotional about stuff. They're going to be very practical about it. So I think about money and I think about goal planning as if you're a business, mm-hmm. right? And when I was a financial planner, I always would think about my my client as if they were running a business because they really are. And a lot of us, sadly, we go to work all day and we make very, very productive and informed decisions about the place we work for. And then we go home, we get all emotional about our money and we, we're so tired, we don't handle that like we're a business. And if you think about those two things, we have it backward. We should really be focusing mostly on our personal net worth and then the business. I mean, the business is important and that's how we make money, but then let's take care of it once we have it. Mm-hmm. So, so when, when I hear that somebody says, don't have a financial advisor because they're crooks, I usually then find out that they went to a financial advisor who was a bad person and that's their story. And I think the lesson that that person learned was not the right lesson. I think the right lesson to learn is that you're a really shitty interviewer mm-hmm. and, and you hired somebody who is horrible on your team. And now you're blaming the fact that you don't know how to hire people on the fact that you had a crappy financial advisor. You had a crappy financial advisor does not mean all financial advisors are horrible. It means you didn't interview a good person. You, right. you, you didn't ask enough questions. You didn't, you didn't hire somebody. And so instead of remolding and finding the right person, we just go, no, 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 don't have those people because you can do it on your own. And you know what's funny? My smartest clients, when I was a financial planner, these people had millions of dollars. They could do it on their own. It's not about being smart. It's about protecting your blind spots. It's about having somebody else in your corner who's smart to disagree with you. Like, I love it when my, when my coaches disagree with me. It's fantastic. Right. And the older I get, the more I like that. Argue mm-hmm. with me. Tell me why I'm wrong. When I was younger, I wanted you to placate my ego more. Now, mm-hmm. the older I get, the more I'm like, nope, tell me exactly where I'm wrong and where I'm stepping in it. Because, man, the quicker I learn that, the better off I'm going to be. Yeah. Did you, so, but to that point, I do think that's why with the people that say, oh, don't ever have a financial advisor. Number one, you know, there is money to be made, but I guess to the point of, well, you didn't do a good job of interviewing. What can a, an average person getting started wanting to, you know, find a financial advisor? What are the questions they should ask? What should yeah. they look for? Maybe you could help us with that. 
the first thing to do is interview more people mm -hmm. because like anything, the more you get engrossed in that topic, the more you're going to know strengths and weaknesses of people. What I found sadly, and I thought I was a pretty damn good financial advisor, but most people, I was the only person they interviewed. Yeah. So, th so they would come into my office because their friend worked with me and they would just go, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. I told them my story and who I was. And they're like, okay, you're the guy. And, and in, don't get me wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to take your money and be your advisor and I'll be great at it. So I, I never said this out loud, but inside I always thought, are you kidding me? You are, you're interviewing one person to, to look at the most important thing. So the, the very first thing I do is interview more people. And, and I'll give you an analogy for, for my wife just had a milestone birthday mm -hmm. and for her birthday, she's always wanted to have an e-bike, right? One of these elect, oh. uh, electric bikes. Yes. And, and I got super involved in that community. By, by the way, you can't not get involved because the second that you go search for anything, now my Facebook feed is full of e-bikes, like yeah. every e-bike company out there. Yeah. But I went and looked at I went and looked at so many different companies, and I learned what questions were important to me by looking at more companies. And actually, the funny thing at the end that I, that was the linchpin for me, the question when it came to e-bikes, and I know this isn't an e-bike question, was this, was somebody wrote in a discussion forum when they were comparing two bike brands, they said, well, go with, with Rad Bikes, which is the biggest company that makes them, because there's so many new companies in this field, you want the one that's going to be in business and is going to be around. And, and what's funny is that's what I would tell people about life insurance when I was a right. financial planner. Like if you've got the same quote from two companies, go with the one you've heard of. Because if somebody dies 20 years from now, the reason you have life insurance in the first place is to get that check. Right. And, and if we know the company, if we know the company by name, I think that that, that, that matters. So, so that's the first thing, interview more people. And I know it's a pain and I know people don't like confrontation, but man, it gets easy. The more people you interview, the easier it gets. And you'll right. see things you like and things you don't like. Here's the next thing I would do. I would ask about credentials. Mm -hmm. What degrees do they have? What licenses do they hold? Are you a certified financial planner? Is, mm -hmm. is a good question. By the way, that does not make somebody necessarily a better planner or a worse planner. Odds are they're probably a better planner if they've taken time to get the degrees and, and, and to learn more about their field. They're a student of their field, so right. they're probably better. You're never going to know completely who's perfect, but you can get these clues, and I think asking them about certifications is good. How long have you been in the field? I remember Susie Orman telling people when I had been in the field for three or four years, she, she said, listen, you got to have somebody with 10 years of experience. Mm -hmm. And I used to always say that is baloney because mm -hmm. I'm early in my career. I am hungrier. I am going to be more on your team. You know, somebody who's been in the field 10 years is going to be a little more detached, a little more removed. All that is true, but Susie's right. Find a planner who's been doing it for at least 10 years because I will tell you that years one through 10, yeah, I was seeing a lot more people than my client was. I, I knew more about different financial situations because, you know, when you're working with 200 families, I'm yeah. seeing situations, you know, I would help three or four people retire every year right? and you want to retire one time. So to have somebody in your corner that's been through it three or four times a year, I think is a, is a big benefit, but I still was learning a, right. a lot and the chance that, and don't get me wrong, I'm still learning today, but 10 years, I've seen so many different things. The probability that I've seen what you've been through before, much, much higher than somebody who's been around three or four years. Yeah. Also somebody who's brand new, the only way to be successful as an advisor is to continue to be an advisor. Right. And when you're brand new, you have to work with anybody. You have to give advice that helps you maybe sometimes more than it helps your client. It still helps your client. It's directionally right. It's what's called suitable advice. And I'll get back to this in a second. But like mentors of mine told me, the only way for my clients to win when I'm a new advisor is for me to stay in business. Yeah. If I stay in business, my client wins. And the bad news is I have to do a lot of compromises early in my career to stay in business. Late in my career, later in my career, I don't have to make those, those compromises. Right. I can make sure that it's 100% right, which gets to, by the way, the final thing that I hear people talk about, which is 
people will say, if you are going to hire an advisor, make sure they're a fee-only advisor, right? Uh They charge just a fee for service. There's no commissions attached to anything. While directionally, that is correct. That's way overblown by financial media. And I'll tell you why. Commission-only advisors are going to do something that maybe is only 80% right, which, mm-hmm. which, by the way, is horrible, right? You're going to probably get a product that might not be the best fit. Right. A woman named Jane Bryant Quinn, who is a wonderful journalist, been around forever, Jane did this whole study that was fascinating. Commission-only advisors, the implementation rate of the plan is incredibly high. Mm-hmm. And the reason it's high is because the advisor doesn't get paid unless you do it. And the bad thing is, is that behaviorally, we're inclined to not do anything, right? Right. What Jane complains about with fee-only advisors is the advisor gives you the advice. It's incredibly objective. It's 100% correct, but you don't implement any of it. But, and the advisor doesn't really care if you implement it because you're, the advisor already got paid. So, they, hey, you don't want to implement that, Jennifer? Fine. Don't implement it. Yeah, I'm still getting my fee. Yeah, I still get my fee. So, so, so it brings up a question. And by the way, and I'm not saying that one is right and one is wrong. I personally think that a fee-only advisor is the better way to go, but you have to implement the advice. And you have to realize that this person's giving you 100% objective advice, so go implement it. Mm-hmm. But what I saw as an advisor was people, some of the best advice I gave, I would have people go, yeah, I don't know. Like they treat it like it was a buffet and they didn't really want to know. It just didn't feel good. So no, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. Okay. All right. Okay. Or I'm, or I'm going to wait. And a fee only advisor is much more likely to do that. So I prefer fee only advisors, but I think there's much more of a question mark than we see in the financial media. Financial media will tell you always get a fee only advisor. That's right. horrible advice. If you're a waffler, if right. you're somebody who waffles, go hire somebody who puts you in a kind of crappy product and you at least do it. Because I've seen a ton of people reach their goals using crappy stuff. Yeah. But I've never seen anybody reach a goal with perfect stuff that doesn't save. Yeah. Never, ever have with, they reached their goals. Or, so sorry, or that perfect, got, perfect stuff that never happens. Right, right. Sorry, that got ranty. But no, I think that's really good though. That's what we need. I mean... We need that kind of ranty. And I think it's interesting because the fee only, I don't have a financial advisor, but a fee only. So if they give me financial advice and I say, great, I want to do it. They pull the trigger, right? Yeah. So it's, it's really just, you have to be willing to take the step. Exactly. Um, And well, and I would actually push back on that. I believe you do have financial advisors. You just don't see them as financial advisors. That's true. If, 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 if you're out buying real estate and you're picking somebody's brain, that is your financial advisor. That's that, true. That, that is it. Which is why, by the way, and I'm going to get ranty again. Good. This is why, and we have an online Facebook group called The Basement. There's lots of Facebook groups online. I will see people that will say, you know what? I don't have a financial advisor because I have this group. I have this group of people, so I don't have any anybody, any person in my corner. That might be fine as a starting point. But right. realize who sits online and gives financial advice on Facebook. It's a guy that we rant about on Stacking Benjamins. His name is Earl. He lives in Peoria. He can't zip up his own pants, but he's going to tell you exactly what you should do with your 401k and how everybody else is an idiot. Right. And so Earl, and, and, and by the way, you don't know anything about Earl's background, anything about what Earl does, but you're going to trust that person way more than somebody that has degrees and backgrounds because you don't quote trust financial advisors, but really, but I trust randos on the internet. Right. What the hell is that about? Right. And I get, I get so frustrated by people that have a strong belief in suboptimal online advice mm-hmm. versus, versus uh, finding good people. And I, and, and I know you enough, I don't know you very well, but I know you enough to know that you've found people who yes. you trust and you know when it comes to their opinion. I think sometimes we think that a financial advisor has to be somebody that we sit down with and bear our soul to. I think it's just somebody smarter than you that you've decided is a part of your board of directors that's on the inner, you know, in right. the inner circle. 
Right. That's a really good point. And I think, you know, the number one in your list of things that you should look for is to interview more people. And I think that's the primary blocker in anything is that, especially if it's a realm that you're not an expert in, you're like, well, I don't even know what to ask. I don't even know where to go. I don't even know what to say. And this person seems so smart. So I'm just going to go with them. But it applies. I think it's that permission that you get to ask questions and you, and, and, kind of letting go of, I am not going to be the smartest person in the room as it pertains to financial advice because I didn't study it. And so I'm going to go in a room and ask whatever questions I want to ask and just that permission to do it. Yes. I find that, you know, I'll I'll be talking to people on the phone and I'll I'll say, this is your homework. We talk about things that a good use of your time, your homework is you're going to hang up because it's a lot of fear to like, I got to walk in and talk to somebody. You don't have to do that. Pick up the phone, uh, send them an email, whatever you want, you know, we'll structure it together, but either way you're vetting it. And you're absolutely right. I hadn't even thought about it. I have a million financial advisors now that I think about it because I don't do anything without doing that. We are currently looking at a storage facility investment and we are doing a 1031 exchange. So it's a real estate thing where we can move it without paying capital gains. So we had, we linked up with this organization. This would be our first investment self-storage there was an opportunity. We're taking a look at it and we gave it to people who know and said, tell us what you think. And they went through it with a fine tooth comb and they said, you know, here are all the flaws, here are the downfalls, et cetera. So I was having a conversation with my husband and I said, you know, we're violating rule number one, which is what micro empires is about, right? We don't know anything about self-storage. So why are we moving this entire investment into another investment that we are completely owning I said, our preference is to put the toe in the water. So if we were a small investor with a group of investors, everybody's ass is on the line. I like being a part of that until until I know. I don't want the whole farm on one thing. And so we pulled back from it. And I, I said, we have to know our sweet spots, our sweet, like, I don't want to be a real estate expert. I just want to be somebody who makes money off of real estate. But you're right. I have that financial advisor and we're going up the food chain more and more, like the further up we go and just keep asking questions. And there's no hurry. Like we don't have to do it tomorrow, but there is that sense of urgency. I think like you've got to do something, you know, pull your money out of the stock market when COVID-19 hit. So many people did that, you know, sell everything you have. Don't move, you know, don't, you know, just, just that sort of crazy mindset that you don't have to be in a hurry. That's what I love is when I got to be that person saying, saying, why are we putting all of this money into self-storage? Why wouldn't you put a little bit in? And my client would go, oh yeah. And, and, and I do the same thing. I get excited about stuff. And, and I love it when my coach tells me, goes, why are you going down this road? Yeah. Like, like, what's this all about? Are you just excited about it today? And three weeks from now, you're not going to be like, why, where does this lead you? I've learned, I've learned from my main coach, Mary Lou, to ask that question toward what end? Mm -hmm. Like, instead of, instead of just, this is a great opportunity. She will always say toward what end? And then I walk it through and I'm like, yeah, this goes nowhere. (laughs) This is just a shiny object. Yeah. And I love that. And I think I just talked to a woman yesterday who I think she's very classic. Uh, She's in her late fifties and she's not able to find work because of ageism and she's really struggling yet. She has $800,000 in her 401k. And so an old 401k. And so I said to her yesterday, again, she's like, I'm just struggling. And I said, you still got that money in the 401k? I said, okay, well, why don't we move that to a vehicle that can buy you an income producing property? Now, again, I'm not going to be the one to tell her how to do that, but I can send her to people who could tell her how to do that. But as I can see the blood drain out of her face when I say that stuff, and I, and I said, look, you take 100, take 50 and put a down payment. You don't have to do it all. And, and I'm, not, I'm not going to be the one to tell you to do it all. I'm sort of the beginner. I'm like, you're yeah. starting with me and then you need to talk to like 30 other people before you make your decision. Absolutely. Learn how it works. Yeah. And don't be, I just think that there's so much fear around just showing up and being a student, showing up and being like, I have no idea what this is about. And that's why I'm here to learn. Well, why is that, by the way? Because it, it, it really seems to be, you know, we, we use the word systemic a lot lately. I think it's a little overused, but it does seem to be systemic in our culture that I think we don't like to be wrong. 
or perceive that we don't know. Yet, if we create more of a learning culture for ourselves, I love this idea. Uh, we had a guest on our show, a guy named Josh Kaufman, who 10 years ago wrote this book called The Personal MBA. Mm-hmm. And I love, I love the idea of a personal MBA. Just the idea of, I'm going to create this curriculum for myself about what I need to know. And immediately, I think when you think about curriculum and what I need to know next, you create this learning culture for yourself where it's okay to not be right. It's okay to, to, to not know. And instead, you're making this list of what am I going to learn about next? What am I going to learn first? And, and put yourself back in school. Yeah. I think it's fascinating. Cheryl has an uncle who is a retired professor, and he is 87, I think. And he is always, we called him yesterday, and he is always still learning and wondering and asking questions. And I think that's why there's days I, I forget he's 87. Mm-hmm. Because he's such an inquisitive person. And I, this guy's going to live for a good long time yeah. because of the fact that he's inquisitive. His brain's in the game. And I think it's that learning culture that does it. Man, just create your own MBA for yourself. And I think it's a lot of fun and also gets rid of some of that stigma yeah. of, oh, do I really have to go talk to somebody about this? Right. And it turns it into, no, I want to talk to somebody about this. Right. I think, I, I don't know what... I mean, I think there's a lot of folks that, you know, 40, 50, and it's like, well, I can't ask questions because then I look stupid or whatever. But one of the best compliments I ever got in my life, I went on a mastermind and there was this incredibly talented, unbelievable CFO at the age of 26 years old. He was just amazing. Just a, I don't know, just a walking brain. And I, I hate love, those people. I, no, I, I love people like that. <laughs> I love people like that. And so we went on this mastermind and at the end you do this thing where you kind of, you know, pick a person in the room and say something nice about it. Now here I am old enough to be his mama and thinking he looks at me and thinks, I, I don't know what I think he thinks, but he's so analytical and so dry and so whatever. Anyway, he picks me and he said, I've never met anybody your age who is so curious about everything and somebody my age and really wants to learn. And other than the fact that he said your age, I found that really uh, (laughs) complimentary, (laughs) but I just, I, I, I hadn't thought about it like that. And I walked away going, you know what? He's right. I am. I'm curious and I want to be curious. It's what I think it keeps you young and it keeps you, you know, I just find it like, I, I really love being the dumbest person in the room, which is often not a challenge. So um, you hear these stories all the time though, Jennifer, you hear, you know, the person who, who works a job, they retire at 62 or 65, and then they're not with us at, you know, three years later, they're, yeah. they're gone. And I think it's that shutdown process. I think yeah. they think, okay, yeah, I'm at the end now. Time, yep. time for me to go. And I don't have any medical proof, like I haven't done a study or anything, right. but, I, but I have to believe it's that not staying inquisitive. Right. And I see it, honestly, I see people 30 years old that are right. like that. Like Already they, shut down. Yeah, yeah, they're shut down. They're like, everything has gone. The other thing is, I say this to people, I, you don't see a whole lot of multimillionaire entrepreneurs out there that are overweight and smoking. Right. So it's the whole like mind, body, everything that ties in together. And I see, I see a lot of people at 30 years old. It's like, okay, I'm done. I guess I'm doing this for the next 50 years. And I, I can't imagine. And it's funny because there, well, there's a, there's a vein here that we, I'm sure we won't have time to get to, but there also is, I haven't encountered a ton of multimillionaires and I know there are some out there that are really chasing the money. They're all, they're all chasing something else. I mean, Warren Buffett isn't like, I got to add another zero to my net worth, you know? I mean, wh- right. wh- why is he still trading stocks? Like, right. what's the deal? What's the deal there? He's, right. he's doing what he loves. He's doing what he loves. So we are going along, but I did want to touch on something you, you mentioned a couple times. You talked about coaches. So I'm interested to know who your coaches are and why you got them and what your experience has been about that. Cause coaching is the new consulting, right? <laughs> you remember, remember in the nineties where like everybody was a consultant, <laughs> yes. and now everybody's a coach. And I, listen, I think coaches are very valuable. I just wish there was another word because I'm doing it as well. I mean, at the end of the day, if you have something to say and people want to hear it, you're coaching in some way, but I'd love to know who and why 
and what the experience has been like for you. So, so I, I have two different types of, of coaches. And it's funny because I never looked at it this way until I interviewed a guy named Tony Stubblebein, who is one of the early investors in Twitter and now has a platform called Coach.me. Mm-hmm. And Tony talked about how, you know, when you want to learn something and you want to learn it fast, hire a coach. And, and your co- it doesn't have to be a coach forever. It's just a coach for the next six weeks to bring me up to speed very quickly on this because our brains are wired for stories. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we can get a book and it will fill our head full of data, but that's not the way we learn best. Um, So having a coach to do it for me. So I'm often plugging in coaches over the short run. I and I will tell you about a few of them, but I also have some longtime coaches. I also overpay, I think, for coaching, hmm. but I think it's my natural curiosity, and I've learned that that's how I learn best, so I'm much more likely to go out and grab a coach to teach me something uh, on a topic. So I have a coach, Mary Lou. Mm-hmm. Mary Lou has been my primary coach for, oh my goodness, well over 20 years. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. And she looks at the world completely differently than I do. Before coaching was even cool. Completely differently. She, she was somebody that when my kids were young, I was very engrossed in business. And she was the one that made me realize that this time was going to go very quickly. And I had to make sure that, A, my business had to succeed. But at the same time, I had to create some memories with yeah. my kids and some bonding and learn who my kids are and have fun. So that's why I was the, you know, Cub Scout leader. Didn't have time to be Cub Scout leader, but I was Cub Scout leader. So my son and I would have that. I remember nights freezing our ass off in a tent and just he and I still talk about that and how fun that was. I was my daughter's assistant soccer coach. Another friend of mine, a guy named Brian was the head coach and, and I helped coach that. So I made sure because Mary Lou made sure that I looked at the entire world instead of just my job. Huh. And, and I love that. She also, whenever I am thinking about any opportunity, she's that person that says, toward what end? Like, like what? Why, why are you actually doing this? Wow. And sometimes she really annoys me because she looks at the world completely differently than I do. And I'm like, oh, come on, Mary Lou, just let's get off this topic. Mm-hmm. But it always turns out that she's, you, not always, but 99% of the time she's right. And I need to look at this area more, but I don't want to. I'm very right. hard headed. I want to look right. at things differently. So she is more of a, you know, there's this brand, a life coach. Yep. That sounds a little woo woo for me, but she's, but anyway, uh, uh, that's Mary Lou. And then I have a diet and fitness coach, oh. a woman named Jessie at a company called MetPro. Jessie is, <laughs> Jessie's the most enthusiastic person on earth. Uh Jesse's always, so we text back and forth all the time, but once a week we have a phone call and Jess and and Jesse also is like skater woman, which is totally not me. But my impression of Jesse on Thursday, she's like, Joe, man, what's happening? How you doing? (laughs) Dude, I saw you made it 192 pounds this week. That's awesome. That's That's so awesome. I'm like, yeah, I could have reached 191. We'll get it next week, man. We'll get it next week. You're going to be okay. It's going to be great. She always makes me so excited. And by the way, what I love about Jesse's motivation, her technique, which is not Mary Lou's technique. Mary Lou's technique is you're effing this up. She'll yeah. tell me you're effing this up. I love her already. Yes. But Jesse, well, Jesse's more wicked because she hides it. This is, this is, this is what Jesse does. I was at a conference that I knew I was going to for, this is just before COVID, that I knew I was going to for for a while. Jesse knows that when I go to a conference, there's often wine and dine events. And there's times when I'm presented with food and I love different foods and and I'm going to, I'm going to chow down. And there's times when Jesse and I have agreed that that's okay. And there's times when I'm going to try to get through this conference and make sure that I stay on the plan, right? right? So this particular conference, I'm supposed to stay on the plan. Well, I get two days into this four day conference and I'm not on the plan at all. I am so, I don't even know where the hell the plan is, Jennifer. Like right. the plan is way, way over there. It's under a and cheeseburger I, somewhere. <laughs> I can't even see it. Jesse writes me a text and this is Jesse's text. How's it going? How do you feel about the food choices you're making? Oh God. 
It, and I hate that. Yeah. How do I feel about yeah. the food choices? I'm like, I feel like crap about the food choices I'm making. It's a, so Jesse, Jesse just holds up the mirror, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and goes, so how do you feel about this? Not how does she feel? Right. And so now every time I pick up a piece of food, I always, I always think, how's Jesse going to throw this back in my face? <laughs> And, and yeah, so, so I've got, I've got Jesse. We also have a financial planner, mm-hmm. Rick, who's a, who's a fantastic guy. We meet with him a couple times a year. And, and the, the cool thing about Rick that's great is that Cheryl has heard my BS about money, you know, for 27 years. This is somebody else talking to us about our money. So yeah. the, the great thing about Rick has nothing to do with me or knowing what I'm doing. It's, it's Rick signing off on the plan. Right. And, then, and it's great. It is, that's absolutely fantastic. Those are, my, those are my three main coaches that I have. One for body, one for the whole, one for the whole universe of how's my life going. I also signed up for a group called Strategic Coach. Hmm. They cost a lot of money. They're very, very good. They, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you the great thing that's in Strategic Coach is an organization. I have a coach named Gina, but it's all part of a program that this guy, Dan Sullivan, created. So I go to these meetings four times a year. It's always with other entrepreneurs. You're learning from these other people as well. The great thing that Strategic Coach did, and I've been with them for a year, is the very first meeting we had, we talked about our life. And without thinking about it too much, they asked me to put down what age I thought I was going to die. Like, what age do you think you're going to die? Wow. And I said, 82. Without thinking about it, 82. I'm going to die at 82. And they said, okay, well, put yourself a year before death. How do you want people to know you? Like, how do you, what is it about your life that you want people to, to remember? And, and I wrote down, I want to be active. Mm-hmm. I want to be a resource. I want to be respected by my community. And by active, I mean this nonprofit that I've been a part of. We put on a half marathon every year. And I love these flipping 80 year olds that are running 13 yeah. miles, right? Yeah. It's amazing. amazing. So I want to be that guy, but I want to be a resource. I want to be respected in the community. I want, I want my kids to come to me and to not just have a great relationship with me, but I want them to say, hey, dad. What do you think about this? I want people in my community to go, hey, Joe, what do you think about this? And I was surprised, by the way, by how much being respected mattered to me. Mm-hmm. And before, before they asked that question, I had no idea. So anyway, so I write all this stuff down. And then, oh, and then about money, what do you want? And, and I wrote down for that, that I want to have enough money that I just don't care, that I can do whatever I want to do, and I don't have to worry about it. I'm not even thinking about money. I'm doing it because it's what I want to do. Right. And anyway, so then, then they... Gina, my coach then said, take all those things, take all those things. And if you, if you had all those things a year before 82, you know, regardless of, or, or let's say that it's not medically related, it just is atrophy, right? We talked earlier about atrophy. How much longer would you live if you were all those things? If you were active and respected and a resource and didn't care about money and just doing whatever you wanted to do, and you're still learning and all this stuff. And I'm like, my God, God, I'd live another 12 years. I, w- right. I would live to be 94 if I did that. And then, of course, then they get down to the end of that and they go, why are you waiting till 81 right. for all these things? Why right. don't you live that way now? And that was a punch in the freaking gut. Really? I have to, but yeah, I, I don't know why. I should have seen it coming. Like everybody <laughs> listening to this probably saw it. I didn't see it coming. I'm like, oh yeah, when I'm 81, I want all this. Like, why are you waiting till 81? Yeah. Why wouldn't you do that at 51 or 52? Yeah. So now I look at those all the time and I think, am I really being those things? Right. Am I working toward those things? So today, today is the day. Today is the day. Yes. Yeah. Today today is it. You know, that, that is, is interesting. And did you, did you go to strategic coach? Cause there was something that you wanted to accomplish that you were like, I need, I have three coaches, but I need this other. Was there a very specific thing? I went to strategic coach because even though, even though Mary Lou is kind of my overarching coach, we have a tendency to get in the weeds yeah. and, and, and my co-host OG on the show has been a strategic coach for five years, I think five or six years. And, and he said, he's like, you know what? There's a bunch of young entrepreneurs in here. You're going to get far more out of strategic coach than anybody I know. He's like, I just know you. I know what you do. And yep. let's, let's have Stacky Benjamins pay for you to go to strategic coach. Great. Like that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I went and we changed a bunch of stuff around the show and like yeah. how we operate the show because it's, so I really needed to get back up at 10,000 feet. 
you know, yeah. and look at my life from a much higher level than Mary. Mary Lou and I have known each other so long that we don't get up there that much. We're more like, okay, what am I going to do this week? Which by the way, the cool thing now about Mary Lou's role is that after I go to a strategic coach meeting, we talked earlier about coaches and behavior and about yeah. implementing stuff. Yeah. I take the strategic coach stuff and immediately download it with Mary Lou and we put it all on the calendar. She and I, and she makes sure every week that we're implementing this big, big, big picture stuff. So that is yeah. fantastic. That is yeah, fantastic. I, I think I have too many coaches, but, but, but I love it. And, I, and I, I mean, it's not unlike, uh, you know, without getting too touchy feely, it's not unlike counseling, you know, it's just a little bit more strategic, a little bit more, maybe less emotions, whatever. But I always say like, I love counseling. I love it. I'm going to be counseled to the grave. I'm just, you know, just verifying I'm good to go. But coaching is something that is coming up. It's coming up all the time. And I love the definition of if you want to learn something and learn it fast, this is the way you do it. And that, that concept of it can be six weeks, not six years. It doesn't have to be forever. It could be for a period of time. And anywhere you put your money, usually you put the effort, you know, right yeah. after it. Agreed. Well, I think that's all for today. I just, this has been really great. And I love, I love where we went. We went to money, to shame, to coaching, to families and it was really enjoyable. I don't know if it's the normal path of what you talk about, but <laughs> I I really liked it. And I think there's a lot, I, so much to get out of this, especially around the financial advisors and, and uh, coming from someone who did it for years. I didn't even get to talk to you about, you know, the podcast and how that all came to be, but maybe you'll come back on and we could do that another time. That's all right. This was, this was a ton of fun. It was, it was a ton of fun. Thank you. I, I do have a joke. But I'm willing to share with you unless you want me to save it for when I come on the show. <laughs> it's so genius. I don't know. I'm looking at you and it's like bursting. It's right there. Right there. Okay. It is right. You'll okay. have another one when you come on the show. Oh, I will. Well, the good news is this is the thing. So Stu and I have this thing where we tell each other our really bad jokes. And because we both have short-term memory loss, it's a new day. Every day is a new day. So he is, he's, I have told him the same joke for five years and he still doesn't know the punchline, but I do the same thing. <laughs> so what do you call a hen who balances her own checkbook? Hold on. A hen who balances her own checkbook. Oh my God. I have no idea. A math of a chicken. Oh my God. Isn't that great? <laughs> Listen. I've seen your dad jokes online. Why does, why, why does, why does a chicken coop have two doors? Hen, hen in the, hen in the front. I don't know why. Because if it had four doors, it'd be a chicken sedan. Uh, but a bang. <laughs> First oh, thing I thought of when you hurts. said the chicken hurts, joke, sorry. Yeah, it hurts my soul a little. That one hurt my soul a little. Mine is related <laughs> to like money. It's a math of a chicken. Yours Hilarious. is. Mine's just related. You bring up one chicken joke and I've got like five we got, more. We got a lot of chickens yes, to go. It's bad. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Well, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you would subscribe and review this podcast, it would mean the world to me. It truly is the only way for me to know how I'm doing and what you hear and what you'd like to see in the future. If you want to reach me, you can at a lot of places. My website is www.micro-empires.com. You can email me at jennifer at micro-empires.com. You can call or text 213-973-7206. And of course, you can reach me on social media, on Facebook under my name or Micro Empires. I have a page and a community. You can find me at Twitter and Instagram under my name and of course on LinkedIn. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time.